continue to not be overwhelmed, but I'm continually at, uh, I'm puzzled this morning by this very strong, saturating smell of flowers. And I, 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 I try to explain it in my mind, um, but it's real. And I'm just staying here just smelling an abundance as though I just walked into a garden and I'm smelling this beautiful smell of flowers right here. And it continues to be, it just came, comes in waves. And I can't explain that. But I think of that, maybe it's God's message to me sometimes that when we go through challenges and difficulties in life, and sometimes we get discouraged and disappointed, and we sometimes even question, Lord, where are you? We need just to close our eyes and smell, and God's presence is there. God's presence is always there. And it makes the aroma of a situation change. Sometimes life don't smell too good, but when God's presence is there with you, He brings the smell of flowers in every situation. Life can't stop God's presence from changing your life. Isn't that a beautiful thing? To think? Maybe we should just stop there. Life can't change what God wants to do in your life. People, situations, illnesses, accidents, problems, no matter how big, no matter how many, there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Nothing too big, nothing too dark, Nothing too fearsome. God's love for you can never be broken. That's when Jesus died on the cross. The Bible says, though he was beaten and he was crucified, not one bone of his body was broken. He never was truly broken. His love for you has never been broken. And his grace will never be broken. So here we are in the book of Acts. And I'm going to begin reading this passage that's found in the 8th chapter, if you're there with me. I'm going to begin reading at the 26th verse. 8, chapter 8 of Acts, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go! God is a God of action. That's why this book is called the book of Acts. He says, Go south to the road. The desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. You know, things won't get done unless we're obedient to God's call. God has laid on my message here in another couple weeks. And the message is entitled because of what some lepers said many years ago. They said, why sit you here till we die? We need to go. And we as God's people, why do we want to sit where there might be comfortable pews, or we might want to sit and be comfortable in our situation, but God never called us to be comfortable. He called us to go. And in the book of Acts, we read how this man named Philip was called to go. And so in verse 27, so he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace. Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. And the Spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I? He said. Unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Verse 32. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before the shear is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who could speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began 
with that very message of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. In verse 36, and as they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water and Philip baptized him. Lord God, be with me and give me the very words to speak that you would be pleased that they would come from your spirit and they would be filled only with truth and love and wisdom. In Jesus' name, I pray to magnify your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Here the scripture tells us about a disciple named Philip, and he was on the go. We ought to be on the go. We as God's people have been called into action to serve, to deliver, to prepare, and to go into the world to be ambassadors for Jesus, sharing God's truth with love and wisdom and integrity. Philip is an example of who we need to be. He was available to God's call. God called him to be obedient. And Philip said, where do you want me to go? And God brought him to a place that was a desert. You know, it's interesting that this is where this story took place. Here is where God wanted Philip. He was in a desert. Sometimes we may question, Lord, why am I here in life? I'm in the middle of a desert. If you're where God wants you to be, God is going to do something great in your life. Quit looking around with your eyes and quit smelling with and listening with your own physical ears because where God wants you to be, it's a good place. God wanted Philip to be in the desert at this point. Why? Because he wanted him to share Jesus with this man who was traveling to Ethiopia. God has an appointment for all of us if we're only willing to be obedient to share Jesus with others. And it may be in a desert place. It may be in a place that we weren't expecting. But God places you in situations that you probably never thought you'd be in. But keep your eyes open because God knows what he's doing. You're going, to in, you're going to get involved in a person's life that needs to hear the story of Jesus. But the focus of this message today is on what takes place. The Bible says that the man, after hearing the good news of Jesus, and let us be clear what that good news is, is that God so loved the world that he sent his son Jesus, and he came and died on the cross for your sins. He died for you. He put himself in your place. And he died for your sins. He paid the penalty. Your sin debt. My sin debt. He died for you. So that your sins have been paid for. That if you will by faith trust in Jesus. Your sins will be forgiven. They will be washed away. Such that the sins of your life will no longer condemn you. No longer will you live with guilt. But by God's grace you will be forgiven. And you will have a relationship that is eternal with God. That's the gospel message. And that is the message that Philip shared with this Ethiopian unit. And now we read that after receiving the gospel, he asked the question, should I not be baptized? Today we're going to observe the Lord's Supper. Why do we observe the Lord's Supper? Because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. He promised that one day when Jesus returns, we are going to be gathered to be with him, and we will share a meal, another supper with him. Jesus said, I'll never have this supper again until you are with me. So we look forward to that day that we are going to be with Jesus. The Lord's Supper reminds us what he did on the cross, and it reminds us of his promise that he's coming again. It is what God commanded that we do. And so today... We're going to observe the Lord's Supper. But the word baptism. The word baptize has been confused through many centuries of time. Many people have confused what it really means. And they confuse exactly when it should be done. I've heard some say that it's only the right thing to do is to baptize a baby. And set that child apart as God's ownership. And I fully support when you have a child, 
you should pray and ask God that he would take that child and care for that child, help you be the mother, help you be the father you need to be. But nowhere in the scripture will you find the doctrine that by baptizing a baby, is that child going to be a Christian? It's not there. So it is not an attack on any denomination. This message is to present God's word. I hope anyone that listens to me and knows me, I have learned long ago, it is not up to me to attack any denomination. I'm not attacking any person. My job as a minister for Christ and your job as a minister for Christ, for we're all in the ministry of Jesus, is to present the truth and to do it with love. Not to condemn people, not to try to prove you're right, but God is right. We are all wrong, but that is why we are instructed by God's word. Baptism is a word that means to submerse, to be fully under, to be fully part of. Let's look at how it's used in the scripture. Look with me back at the story of Jesus when he was on earth. In Matthew chapter 3, we read about Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 13, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? And Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented in verse 16, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. Whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River. And on that particular day, many people had come, and they were there listening to John the Baptist preach. And John was preaching the message, prepare because the Messiah is coming. He has come. And then Jesus presented himself. And so if you can, in your mind, imagine there in the Jordan River, there stands John the Baptist, who was baptizing many people who in their hearts, they were preparing for the coming Messiah, the coming King. And Jesus presents himself and says to John, I need to be baptized. And John says to him, no. I shouldn't be baptizing you. You ought to be baptizing me. But Jesus makes these words, let it be so now. Why did Jesus want to be baptized? There's several reasons. Number one, as I said before, the word baptize, the word means to be immersed and to be fully part of. Listen again. The word baptize means to be immersed and to be fully part of. Jesus came to be fully part of what? Our sins. He came to be part of you and me. He suffered fully for all of us. He identified himself for all of us. His cause, his mission was to come into the world and to save us from our sins. He didn't come in and do part of that. He came in and did all of that. Yes, when he went to the cross and he was crucified and when God raised him from the dead, Jesus came and he did all that God had given him to do. For that reason, his ministry begins when he was baptized by John. He identified himself with sinners. He placed himself with those who were lost. That's why the scripture says, he who knew no sin became our sin. You say, does that mean that Jesus, he kind of died for me? No, that's not what it means. What it means is he fully died for you. Your sins, no matter how big or small that you might consider them to be, he died for all of them. He identified himself. He immersed himself in your life. He became fully part of you. And you became fully part of him. When Jesus was baptized, he identified himself fully. Now this is important. I'm not here to criticize anyone. But listen, does it say that John kind of sprinkled him with a little water? No. The Bible says in verse 16, as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. It is a clear picture of how he was baptized, the mode, the mechanism of baptism. He was placed under the water. He went all the way. 
follow with me because we're going to draw some conclusions here in a moment. He was in all the way. When we are baptized, we're either in all the way or none of the way. Jesus was baptized. He went in the water and he was covered completely. Listen, he, he came and he suffered for the unrighteous. He died for the sinners. He came all the way. Look at what else Jesus would go on to say in Luke's Gospel, chapter 12 and verse 50. Jesus said it this way in verse 50 of Luke chapter 12. I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is completed. What was he speaking of? Do you see it? Luke chapter 12 and verse 50. Jesus said, I have a baptism. I've got something that's been given to me to do. And I've got to do all of it. He was speaking of the cross because when he died, what did he say? It is finished. He didn't say it's partly finished. He didn't say I almost got it done. But when Jesus was on the cross and before he died, he said it is is finished. His words imply, I have fully done what God the Father has given me to do. It is my baptism. I've been fully part of God's task. I have fully partaken of the cross. I've died. I've redeemed humanity. I've died for every person that God's given me to die for. The word baptized means to be fully part of, to be immersed. It means to be surrendered. When Jesus said, I have a baptism, Jesus was saying, I'm surrendered to God's, God's will. Remember before he died, he was in the garden praying, and he said, Father, if it can be, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. That's what it means. The word baptism means to be fully surrendered, to be fully part of. And so we read here in Luke's Gospel, the eighth in Acts chapter 8, the story that we read earlier, we read about this Ethiopian unit, and he was baptized. I want us to focus on this for a moment. The book of Acts tells us of numerous stories of how people came to believe Jesus Christ in their heart, and then they were baptized. Never do we read that they were set apart for God because they were baptized as a baby or before their conversion. I want you to listen. This is very important because some people say, well, in, in our church denomination, they go through a special process when they're 12 years old or whatever the age is. And I say this respectfully to anyone. I'm not here to argue with you. I'm here to present God's word and truth. That's not in the Bible. It's not. For example, look in Acts we're in the book of Acts. Look at the second chapter and go back to the story when the disciples are preaching. And the Bible tells us that many, many people, thousands of people are listening. And in chapter 2 and verse 40, look at what, look at, go back up to verse 38. Verse 38, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter replied, repent. What does the word repent mean? It means when you hear that Jesus he came and he died for your sins and was raised again. To repent means not only to seek God's forgiveness, but it is to seek a new walk of life. That's what baptism is a picture of. You have died with Christ and you have been raised again with Christ to live a new life. To repent means God forgive me and give me a new direction. Peter says in Acts chapter 2 verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And then go on with me in verse 40. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted or received his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000 people. That was one great service. But notice, they were to repent, to receive, and they were to be baptized. Go with me again. We already read in Acts chapter 8. Let's go to the story found in Acts, Acts chapter 10. Here we read about a centurion. A centurion was a, spe a special official in the Roman army. He had authorization over at least 
100 men. And here we read that Cornelius is listening to the gospel of Peter in Acts chapter 10. And I'd like to pick up with that story. In verse 44, and while Peter was still speaking these words, Peter is preaching the gospel to Cornelius, this Roman centurion. And while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Continue with me. Look at Acts chapter 16. The scripture says of Lydia. We talked about this story recently as we studied the Philippian jailer. But now we go back to Acts chapter 16. Before the story of the Philippian jailer, we read about this woman named Lydia. In verse 14, I pick up the story. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to, to Paul's message when she and the members of her household were baptized. The stories are numerous, and on and on I could go as references, but the story is this. A person is baptized when they have been converted to Jesus Christ in their heart. I want to say it again, because I did not mention a person's age. It could be 15, it could be 8, it could be 95. When a person is converted to Christ, when they have received the message of God's Word, the Gospel, and God converts their heart. God comes into that dark, dead heart and he gives them spiritual birth. That is when the Bible says a person then should decide as obedience, I need to be baptized. It is your next step in obedience. It is to say to God, I have decided to follow Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. I am alive now in his resurrection. God lives in me and I am all in. Did you hear what I said? Because I said earlier, the word baptized means that you're all in. It means you're partaking all the way. It means you're fully surrendered. When you are baptized, it is your testimony to God and to the world. I am all in. I'm all with Christ. Look how it is pictured in Romans, the sixth chapter. Romans, the sixth chapter, beginning in verse one. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Romans the 6th chapter verse 3. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have live a new life. When I by faith trust in Jesus, the Spirit of God comes into my heart and life. And listen, what takes place is only known by God. But God has put me with Christ on the cross. Now listen, this is very important. When you come to know Jesus, when you believe in your heart that God sent him to die for your sins and that God raised him from the dead, the moment you confess him as Lord of your life and receive God's forgiveness, immediately you have been baptized into the Spirit of God in Jesus' name. Listen, when you're baptized by the Spirit of God, that means your life is now hidden with Christ. God looks upon you and he no longer sees your sin, but he sees the righteousness of Christ. He clothes you with this humility. He clothes you with this holiness. You have been part of Christ by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's why this baptism we have in water, that's why it is so important. Because it is an illustration, it is a testimony of what God has done in your life. You have been baptized into Christ spiritually. Which means, when he was dying on the cross, you were in Christ. 
You can't be saved unless you are in Jesus on the cross. You say, I, I can't understand that. That's faith. It is believing God's word just as it says. Because he died for you on the cross. Which means you were in Christ when he was dying. And when God raised him from the dead, where were you? You were in Christ becoming a new creation of God. That is why baptism shows the portrait of Jesus dying, which means he was buried under the water, and then he's raised again new. That's the power of baptism. It is to show, it is to demonstrate that you, in your heart, you've been saved. And this is your testimony to God, to all people, that Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life. To refuse baptism is a sin against God. If God has given you an opportunity to be baptized, then you should follow the Lord in, in obedience. Absolutely, yes. But make no difference. Listen, am I saved through this water baptism? No. This water baptism, it means nothing unless God has converted your heart. But when God comes into your life and he changes you by believing in Jesus, then a person should be baptized because it is your next step of obedience. The Bible's filled with stories, countless stories, of how people, they believed in Jesus, they were converted to Christ, and immediately they were baptized. Years ago, people were literally killed because of baptism. If you research the church history, when people began, that's one of the words, I believe that's one of the reasons we, word, we read the word baptized. You know that's a transliteration? This is how important baptism is. Follow with me. You say, what do you mean by that? A lot of words are translated. We're not reading the, the Bible in the New Testament written in Greek for most of the, the, the older tra transcripts that we have. And there are many. I've read there's like 25,000 transcripts of the, old, of the New Testament. But they weren't written in English. They're primarily written in Greek. And we have the translations of the Old Testament into Greek called the Septuagint. Now follow with me though. And we read of things like, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Those words, John 3, 16, they're a translation of the original tongue. But there are some words that were transliterated. Baptism is one of those. You say, why? And I believe if you carefully study history, you'll find an ugly part of history. For it was many, many years ago when certain practiced only and taught only to be part of a certain church participation, a person went through a form of sprinkling with water or some action of that. But there were those who held to the truth that baptism in God's word means to be fully submersed in water. But in fear of a certain portion of them at that time, the church, instead of translating the word into the proper word, immerse, in fear of the church, the so-called church, they just tra they transliterated, they took the actual Greek words and just sounded them out into English. And so it became bad times. And people died for that. But I tell you this, God's word tells us truthfully, baptism in the order of God's saving grace is a, is a testimony in your life. I don't think you can fully, truly experience God's saving grace until you're baptized. But make, no, no, make this mistake. Water baptism, nor does participating in the Lord's Supper, these things don't mean anything unless first you have trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And if you're baptized with the right attitude and the right heart, which is this, I've been saved, God has saved me, He died for me on the cross, I believe He's my Lord and Savior, I confess Jesus as Lord, and I want to be baptized because I have been buried with Christ. I want to walk a new life. I repent of my sins. I want a new direction. That is the whole picture of baptism. It means you have been buried with Christ. And now as you raise up out of the water, it is your testimony. I am new in Christ. And I am following Jesus with my life. 
I'm all in. I'm all in. Don't sprinkle me, and I say this respectfully, but here it is. I don't want to just be sprinkled with a little bit of water. I'm going to be baptized, and I'm going to be baptized all the way under because I'm all in with Christ. All my sins have been paid for. They've been buried with Christ. And I've been raised with Christ in the newness of life. And God's Spirit lives in me. And I'm going to walk a new life. That's what baptism means. It doesn't save anyone. But it completes what God has done in your soul. Today we're going to observe the Lord's Supper. And it too, it too cannot save anyone. But when you believe the message of the Lord's Supper, it saves the soul. Baptism, I keep pointing to the baptistry behind me. It can't save anyone. But when you believe the message of baptism, it saves the soul. That you've been buried with Christ. You've been raised again in the newness of life. When you believe that message, which is the gospel, it saves the soul. What is the story of the Lord's Supper? We're going to read the passage in Matthew chapter 26. Jesus said, this is my body. It's broken for you. Take, eat. And then he took the wine. He took the fruit of the vine. He said, this vine is my blood that I give for you. The blood of the New Testament. Drink all of it because it represents what I've done for you on the cross. When I believe that message, it saves the soul. And I want to say to you today, is your soul saved by God? Have you been baptized by the Spirit of God into Christ's body? That's what it means when you're baptized. You have been baptized by the Spirit of God into the body of Christ. I close with this scripture. I want to read from uh, the book of Corinthians. Would you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12? The scripture says that we are all the body of Christ. Notice the, uh, the analogy that it makes. Look at verse 11 of 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. All these are the work of one, the same Spirit, and He gives them to one each as He determines. Verse 12, the body is a unit, though it is made of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. We were all baptized by one Spirit into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, we were all given one spirit to drink. And look at verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ. When you are saved by believing Jesus Christ, God baptized you by the Spirit of God. You have been made part of fully the body of Christ. And now you are part of the body of Christ. Does that make sense to you in your heart today? We're going to have the Lord's Supper here in a moment, but I want us to have an invitation. After the invitation, we'll partake of the Lord's Supper, and you're invited to stay. But the Bible tells us that the Lord's Supper is a special time. A person, a person should reflect in their own heart where they are with God. But if you're a believer in Jesus, you've trusted in Him as your Lord and Savior, you're invited to partake of the Lord's Supper. You say, I don't know if I have that confidence. Well, here's the invitation. The invitation today is God saying to you, I have given my son, I have made the way possible for you to be saved, and I want you to be saved today. God wants you to be saved. The Bible says we will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. The Bible says that there is none righteous, no, not one. We are all in need of God's saving grace, and it comes through believing in Jesus. Would you please stand? We're going to have our invitation. And if in your heart, you know in your heart today you need Jesus. Or if there's something in your life today, you just need to come to the altar and pray about before we have the Lord's Supper. And say, God, forgive me. 
I need to ask you to forgive me because I don't want to I don't want to partake of the Lord's Supper if my heart's not right with you. The invitation's open to you today. Maybe in your heart, maybe in your heart today, God's speaking to you and saying, there's part of your Christianity, there's part of your Christian walk you need to finish. You need to be baptized. Maybe you say, well, I was baptized as a kid. Was it really because in your heart you accepted Jesus as your Lord? If not, then I, according to God's word, you ought to be baptized. And maybe you need to come to the altar and say, Lord, I come confessing you as Lord, and I need to be baptized. And maybe that's a decision you need to make today. God knows your heart. Lord, I pray, give us invitation that Father, the Spirit of God, would speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.